David. Hey, hey, hey. Can you hear me okay? Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You can hear Excellent. me fine. We're all I'm good. I'm very happy to have you. I think the sound is perfect now. Beautiful. Uh, let me welcome you to Marvel Talks. I'm so happy to have you with us. My pleasure. And let me also welcome the viewers who are slowly gathering before the various platforms. Uh, we have a great guest today. I'll say a few things about you to our viewers and listeners through the audio platforms. David Breer is a leading identity and branding expert who, who, expert who has received over 325 international awards. He ranked third worldwide for branding by cloud and is the recipient of the Presidential Ambassador for Global Entrepreneurship Medallion, right? He has been featured in Adweek, Forbes, Inc., Havington Post, Entrepreneur, Business Insider, Communication Arts, How Magazine, and numerous blogs and podcasts. David, this is an accurate snapshot of who you are. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's, it, it's a good start. <laughs> Please, would you like to add something to the cocktail? Um, well, that just that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a passionate, um, a passionate entrepreneur and I love helping companies build their empires. Um, I'm also, oh, actually there's two things that you actually didn't include. Oh my God, I'm going to totally take the advantage of this. <laughs> so, so one is, is my, the, I'm the author of the best-selling book, Brand Intervention, and yeah. with uh, with yeah, exactly, and with 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 Damon John, my buddy Damon, he wrote the from Shark Tank. He wrote the the forward mm. to the book. It's a great book, um, and we're just now actually making available. We just opened up enrollment for a Brand Intervention Masterclass. So we're actually that's very exciting. That's a whole new chapter. That's fantastic. We will talk about everything in a minute. I have your book in my bullets as well. Let's go back to the one-on-one -on -one basics. David, yes. what exactly is branding? What, what is, is branding? It? Good. Okay. <laughs> so, so I, I'm going to human. I'm going to give you a humanized definition because what I find is that sometimes it's a little. You know, it's almost like cer too cerebral. It's like it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like it's this other thing. Branding is my ability as as an individual or a person or a company um, or a movement um, being introduced in the world in such a way as to allow you to recognize, differentiate, and recognize me for what I am. I brought that to a forward definition in my book. It's called the art of differentiation, right? But what that means is that you and I every day are hit with thousands, thousands of messages, texts, you know, notifications, uh, social platforms of all sorts, TV, radio, podcasts, this, that, the other, da, 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 da. that's a lot hitting us how do we rise above the, all of that noise to actually get heard? Differentiation is the tool that achieves that. It allows you and me to go, oh, there's something that doesn't, doesn't blend in and add to all the noise. It actually, I can hear that. I can see that. I can detect that. That means something to me. That's what branding is. It's about differentiation. It's about finding your voice in this noisy world. Totally. And there's, there's a, a whole library of differentiators and there are specific disciplines that allow that to happen. The tool of design allows that to happen. Mm -hmm. The tool of language allows that to happen. The tool of storytelling allows that to happen. The tool of user experience, you know, how do we, how do, how do we interact with this thing? Is it, you know, is it simple? Is it adventurous? Is it disruptive? You know, is it uh, is it challenging or is it just really easier than anything? And all the, all of those things contribute to our experience of differentiation because you and I, last I checked, you and I have a mind and a heart, right? And branding appeals to that mind and heart. How is branding different from marketing? 
to me, marketing is that's getting the stuff out there. Hmm. Branding comes prior. Pra branding define without you can market without branding, which means you're just you're just you're just getting stuff out there. You're getting messages. You're getting things. Da, 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 and it could be all over the place. It's very busy. It's getting things out there. It's getting things seen and heard. And da, 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 da. But branding, it's kind of like I'll give you an analogy. It's like what's the difference between a room full of musicians and a symphony? Okay, you could say, hey, all you musicians without the music charts, we're not going to give any music charts. We're not going to give them a conductor. Mm. We're just going to say, hey, just start playing. They're going to be very busy and making sounds and asking who are you, what key are you in and what key are you in and this, that, the other, and da, 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 da. be very busy. And that's kind of like they may get some sounds out there. They make it an occasional song. That's a little bit more like marketing in that it, it's like the branding puts in, it gets everything to align. Right, it puts everything together. What about rebranding? Is rebranding simply a shift from one niche to another? What's rebranding? Rebranding is solving the fact that the culture has changed. It's solving the fact that the needs have maybe changed. It's solving the fact that maybe the technologies have changed. Like all of a sudden, let's say what was impossible yesterday, now everybody can do. Well, that's, you go, holy mackerel, right? So rebranding is, it's not a, a reactive. You're not just simply reacting, but you're being proactive and paying attention, seeing what's going on. Do we need to pivot? Do we need to adapt? Mm. How are we? How are we still relevant? Right, rebranding is that activity of making sure that our voice is relevant. Sometimes that rebranding is very dramatic. It involves a name change. It involves a totally. You got to redefine who you and what you are. Mm. Uh, and sometimes it's not as dramatic. Sometimes it's a more subtle shift. But it's the ability to pivot. It's the ability to adapt. It's the ability to stay relevant, mm. and 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 it may have a lot of places that it, that are impacted by it. But anyway, that's what rebranding is. So I could think of, let's say, the typical example of Kodak communicating the red room, communicating the film. We all love the film, romanticizing about the 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 film. Suddenly, the digital camera comes along. Is it is it a good rebranding? context or need for rebranding totally i mean Co kodak should have been the leader in see kodak see kodak made a mistake very common mistake they were married to film yeah raw they needed to be married to capturing memories they needed to be married to capturing moments they need to be married to recording moments in life that one could capture. Then it didn't matter whether it was film or mm. digital or whatever. See, they were married to the wrong thing. It's kind of like, it's kind of like Xerox was married to being a copier. They could have been in the, they could have been more if they were married to the space of, let's say, business communications. That would have given mm. them room. They could have easily pivoted, you see, to, okay, business communications today might be a copier. Tomorrow, it might be a fax machine. Tomorrow, it might be a computer. But they had such equity, name equity. Mm. And as did, Co as did Kodak. Kodak, or I mean, Polaroid, same problem. Polaroid easily could have been the digital camera of today. Easily, because it was all, it was the most portable, instantaneous. It had the, mm. that was the one difference. Kodak didn't, Kodak, you know, had the recognition as recording visual experiences, but Polaroid had the factor of doing that with instantaneous, like you immediately, you know, came out and you looked at it. They were probably closer and they really could have been so easily the digital, they could have owned the digital camera uh, category. The portability, the and instantaneous, 
right? We don't wait. Yeah. Uh, I take a photograph. I go click. It's like I look. I go ah, the lighting's perfect. Instantaneous. Kodak didn't you, have that instantaneousness, but Kodak did have a lot, an enormous recognition, enormous recognition, and one of those should have taken the industry, but it now it basically now really belongs to Apple because of the iPhones. Absolutely. So you remind me of the of the story of the popular story of the new CEO of Black and Decker, you know, the drilling company. Yeah. It could be a legend or a real story, it doesn't matter. Stories has power. In his first board meeting, he took a power drill in the boardroom and he fired it up. Good morning, gentlemen. He fired up the drill and he said, Is this what we're selling here? Everyone was stunned. Maybe the guy is mad. And the president of the board told him, excuse me, sir, you have just been appointed of the board of Black and & Decker and, you, and you're wondering what we're doing here. Of course, we're the number one power drill trader in the world. And then the CEO, the clever guy, said, wrong. What we sell here is holes, not drills. Yeah. And in my, in my keynotes, I, I take it a bit further and I say, if tomorrow a new laser technology is invented, which can allow you to drill better holes, we need to stop romanticizing about the drill and get rid of all of them and invest in la laser. So that's the pivot thing. And they're in branding that Kodak, uh, the Blockbuster, Toys R Us, Thomas Cook, all Blackberry perhaps. And I think you're correct. The way you identify yourself can be, can save you or, or destroy you. The way you view yourself, perhaps branding should begin from self-awareness, is it? Well, who am I? Who am I? What am I? Or is not? I, I actually have a slightly different view. Mm. I, don't, I, I think the, I think the self-awareness is too overemphasized. I think it needs mm. to be I think it needs to be client awareness, mm. problem awareness, mm. solution awareness. I will t I often tell clients I say I say the path to your customer's front door does not start at ours it starts at their front door what's the problem that they are encountering the most what's the frustration that is bothering the most what's the biggest annoyance or inconvenience because that's what it's about you know so it's so you don't want to be that's why blockbuster went out of business blockbuster was married to a brick and mortar location that made you and me go in our car, drive to them, go in their store, see what was available or not available. And when we checked out, we bought popcorn and we bought uh, Twizzlers, licorice and whatever else. And then we left. Netflix came shortly thereafter. Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix, turned them down. But Netflix wasn't married to, Netflix started out sending stuff by mail, the DVDs. If they stayed married to that, they would be out of business. Instead, what they were married to was, what do we provide? Entertainment. So when it shifted to digital streaming, no problem. When it, And they even increased it even more. I can't believe someone... That someone actually opted to call us during our moment here. This is, this is <laughs> disgraceful. So the, so the thing is, it's blasphemy. So the thing <laughs> is, is, um, is I'll, I'll, I'll make it so that there's like, that we will not be experienced that again. So the thing that happened is they were able to pivot and not only stop at now making available via digital, but now they make, they produce more programming content than anybody, including Disney. So in the world, so they they really focused. What are what were they married to? What people wanted was entertainment, and however that pivoted was fine. So you don't want to be married to the wrong thing. You don't want to be married to a, a solution or a technology or a channel because that's going to leave you. At some point, it's it's going to outgrow you, or you're going to outgrow it. So at the end of the day, you need to be married to the as you said the customer experience or you need to be married to uh, their a, need. A 
their needs, their, need. their, their need and the tool to satisfy the need. That's where you need to be ready to pivot, to change yeah. the way that you satisfy that need. Yeah, exactly. What do we mean by brand clarity? How do you achieve brand clarity? Does this clash with the idea of that we need to be constantly on our toes to pivot, to rebrand? Do this, do, uh, how, first of all, how do we reach brand clarity? Uh, brand, well, basically, brand clarity, it's, that starts at having to really look at what space you're in is one thing because you have to look at what are the different ways that your cut your potential customers are currently solving the problems that they're running into right so uh let's say you know, let's say um let's say let's take the topic of weight loss let's say someone's like all right we have all these people who want to lose weight okay so you go okay so they all want to lose weight and then what happens is what happens is that while there are diets, there are exercise programs, there are bits of equipment you can buy, there are different uh, regimens where you could train by coaches. These are all different things going after the same way. How do you get clarity in that? You have to look at what the different options that that, that, that one customer is going to have what they can choose from and you now need to amongst all of that noise determine how are we going to stand apart how are we going to be different how are we going to be seen as unique and not and not blending in and adding to the noise because you have two options one is you're either going to add to the noise or you're going to rise above the noise hmm. those are the two things so with the example you gave with the weight loss you could decide that you would be the best weight loss coach there is. You can offer a package that is too good to to ignore, or you can offer lip, liposuction. I don't know for a for a great price. Does it make sense? I mean, do you need to fit yourself into the various existing options that people are predominantly no. opting for, or you need, no. to, or, or no. you can go blue blue ocean. You can. You have, to. New, hmm? you have to. You have to because that's that's the art of differentiation. Going back to where we, where we started, branding mm -hmm. is what the art of differentiation. So if you're going like, well, we're going to just do it better. We're just going to do it faster. Is that mm. enough differentiation? No. Oh, we're going to do. We're going to do it simpler. We're going to, you know, it's. It, are you going to do it with like a, a diet plan? Are you going to do it with a with a point system? Are you going to do it with a community? Are you going to? It's like you're still playing. One thing that I firmly believe is you cannot introduce the new by using the language of the old. Mm. So you've got to figure out, you've got to figure out how do we introduce to the world something that is not just our version of all the options that are already there. We've got to, we've got to pivot enough. We've got to be distinct enough. In what way can we change it? I mean, like, like for example, I mean, like there's one one guy I I, I love him. He's he's a uh, he's a uh, uh, I think I think he would say that he's sort of like a a fitness coach. But he the way he positions it is like, hey, here's the deal. I can allow you to I can help you lose lose twenty pounds, and you can eat whatever you want. And you go, it's like very clear, right? It's mm -hmm. like he's not saying he's not saying. That, it's like here he's hitting two, two, two particular points. He's not saying I have an exercise regimen, which is selling a solution. I have a, I have a diet program, which is selling a solution. I, he's talking about the outcomes, right? You know, and so it's a, just a very, very interesting distinction. It changes it enough where you go, well, that's interesting. Tell me more, right? So, you know, th that's just a, a little minor example. How do you know when you are off brand that your message is off brand? Does it have to do with niching or not necessarily? I would say you know when you're off, you know when you're off brand when people start asking you questions that make you go, why the hell are they asking that? Mm. Or they're confused. 
And they're like, like, you know, I mean, let's say, let's say you showed up and you, and you were like, Hey, we have the most amazing Bluetooth speaker. And they, and they're like, and they're like, so you sell microphones, right? And you're like, ah, right. <laughs> you're like, you're going, so that, you know, so, or they, or, or, or could be, so that's one thing that's category, but you can have it another way. You could say you, you may be attracting the wrong kind of customer. Let's say you're looking, you're attracting customers that are only looking for a real, something really cheap, but what you sell is really premium. That tells you right there, you're off brand. You're not even somewhere in your messaging. You're mm. off, right? Because of the, 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 the people and the, the prospects that come to you, you understand that your message is inconsistent, not coherent, confusing, Exactly. Or one of the above. Yeah. Well, I would say I, I would say I would say all of the above. Plus, let's say, let's say you're losing a lot of you're losing a lot of deals to your competitor, and you know that you have like a easily, easily or equal, if not better than they are, but you're losing the deals. There's something that's not connecting. Um, and here's just another little example. I remember there used to be some companies uh, some years ago. They were all about simplicity. You'd go to their website. It would make you go from page. You'd click on here. You'd have to take you to another page. Da -da -da, click on here. Click another page. Da -da -da, click on here. So you'd have to go like five pages to complete a transaction or to find out a simple answer to, to a question. But yet they're saying they're about simplicity. That's off brand, man. It, a brand should be the ultimate embodiment of what it's about. You know, it's it's kind of like, you know, if, if you're if you're about user experience, it's got to be an amazing user experience. If you're about speed, well, you better be able to go mm. from zero to 60 in, in two, you know, two point one seconds. Right. If, you know, et cetera. Et cetera. So it's got to be you, things have to align. There's a synergy between experience, deliver deliverable and all that. At the end of the day, if you choose to go the cheap route, that's fine as long as this is what you communicate and this is what you want people to know that you do. For example, if you say that what we sell is cheap microphones, right? For your kids, for your dogs, doesn't matter. Uh, and, you, and you pay $10 or $5 for them and people want cheap microphones, that's fine. But if you say that you cheap creme de la creme microphones and you sell rubbish, you have a problem. Right. Well, look, I mean, look, let's let's take the most obvious example in terms of price, right? Walmart. Hmm. The Walmart customer does not go in there expecting to get the best thing in the world. They expect to be getting the best price in the world, right? Price is the value to that customer, right? Other hmm. customers, you go to an Apple store, you're expecting a very personalized, clean, awesome experience space you could check the stuff out it's not going to be high pressure etc you go to you go to uh the car car showroom uh of a mercedes right or bmw or aston martin and you go you're going to have an experience there's an expectation mm -hmm. expectations see expect there's different benchmarks for every type of brand the bench, the, the 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 benchmark of expectation is low at Walmart. You don't expect to have an amazing experience. Mm. You simply expect to be able to get stuff cheap, right? You go to a higher a higher quality, more premium product, then you're going to actually have a higher expectation. So it's that benchmark, that threshold. I've read somewhere that I think in a podcast that you 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 participated in saying something very interesting, two propositions which caught my attention. First one, if you haven't built trust, you cannot discuss price. That's a, an extremely intriguing proposition. Can you tell us a few things about this? Yeah, well, it's, I never, ever, ever discuss price prior to establishing trust and value. Mm. Because what, otherwise, you have no understanding what are they comparing anything against they're comparing it against what they know before 
So unless you've actually set up a context for, okay, this is the industry standard, right? That's prior experience. You've looked at other options. Yes, I have. Good. What have you seen? Well, I see blah, 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 blah. Good. Here's what we offer instead of that. Boom. So that's there. And that, let's say that's on a scale of one to 10. Let's say that's a four in your eyes. Hmm. Now they may, without you explaining what you're offering, which let's say, let's say what you're offering is a 10 on a scale of one to 10. Unless you've established credibility, value, and trust, they might be thinking that four is a 10. And all of a sudden you come along and you say something and your price is two or three times the price. You have no, right? You, you, the, you haven't given them the, uh, you haven't educated them sufficiently to be able to have judgment. That's why you've got to establish credibility and you've got to establish trust and you've got to establish that value clearly. Otherwise, you have not made it possible for them. They cannot have judgment otherwise. At the end of the day, especially in the services market where it's a high ticket market like when when you offer branding services or when you when i offer consulting services or coaching whatever i mean you can charge whatever you want but if if people cannot really understand where you're coming from or feel or or be convinced that you have a unique value to provide to them they will certainly not consider a high price justifiable in and by itself, I think. That's so right. A is it correct? Yeah, I agree. So the other proposition, which leads me to, to your other proposition or statement, saying that if you haven't differentiated yourself, you cannot discuss price, which goes back to what you said, that the prospect needs to be educated or coached into understanding what is already available out there so that you can say, okay, fine, what we do is this, is B and not A. Can yeah. you can you can you comment on, on this proposition? Totally. On the differentiation. Yeah. Hmm? Totally. I'll, I'll give I'll give you a perfect example. My wife and I, uh, some years ago, we found that every year, because of travel, every year we were having to replace our luggage because it would just get beaten up and it would get ripped and it would this, this would happen, that would happen or whatever, or zippers would break or whatever. It would be like, and, and we did enough travel that every year and we're, and we're looking at each other going, we're not buying junk, hmm. we're buying good stuff and it's, it's breaking. And it's like, it's, we're, we're shocked. So what happened was we ended up going to this luggage store. We'd never been to uh, like, that's all that they sold this whole store. It, it was wall-to-wall -wall luggage. It was like we saw more brands than we'd ever seen. We were like amazed. And you had the usual brands, but then you had, then we saw some other brands. And there was one brand that we had seen, and it's called Briggs and Riley. Now, Briggs and Riley is a very, very interesting brand because we looked at it and they said, and they, they showed us the features, this, that, the other. Two things immediately caught my eye. One is, is that every product has basically a sewn-in dog tag to identify that with the, the serial number, to identify that particular piece. It like authenticated it, that was one thing. Second thing is, is that if your zipper ever breaks, if anything happens, you send it in, they will, they will repair it or, or replace it, period. No contest, no, no argument. So in other words, and so I'm like, wait a second. So I'm like, so I'm looking at it. I like the craftsmanship. Da, 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 da. If I have a broken zipper, I send it in and it's going to be fixed. And now that's the only brand we buy because basically we don't have, we're not, we, we've stopped replacing the uh, endless replacement. So that was an example of differentiation. And then we were willing to spend more money for that because we didn't have to every year replace and spend, replace and spend. That's just one example of differentiation. And it was an offer that for whatever reason, nobody else has ever made. It's great. 
which allows you to command your price in a sense is it correct exactly basically so it, and the thing is it's not like we just you know we still will you know every every few years we'll go oh you know what we need a blank and we where do we go briggs and riley briggs and riley briggs and riley so they're so they're we just we just love them because their customer service is excellent the craftsmanship's great and if anything ever goes wrong it's fixed. It doesn't never. It never gets thrown away. It never gets put in the garbage. So yeah. So I mean that that differentiate that single differentiator right there. I mean, look. You want to talk about another great example? Dyson vacuum cleaners, right? Mm. Vacuum cleaners for what? 60, 70 years never had changed, right? They all had the bag and the, the suction into the bag, and it would leak, and it would this, that, the other, and whatever like that. None. Nobody had changed until Dyson came around. Now Dyson did five thousand prototypes until he got it right and so he he developed his turbine and he used design right he used colors that nobody ever used he used materials that nobody ever used. he used plastic so you could see the turbine as you're actually cleaning and and it had pivots and all kinds of different very interesting design components now that was you know so he came out all of a sudden overnight Every other vacuum cleaner company became yesterday's technology, right? And he used differentiation, customer experience, etc. Mm. You looked at it, and their price was high. And I think with it, I think they became like the number one selling vacuum. I think they sold like fifteen million. I, I mean, it was, it was. I have the number somewhere in some article. The amount of units they sold was unbelievable just after a couple of years. And that was all based on differentiation. Is price, is setting a price a trap in what sense? If you are coming out with a new product or a new service, in the service world is more relevant as a question. Is, if you position yourself at, on a certain price range, uh, and then for whatever reason you feel that that price was too low or too high, is it something that can damage your brand? I mean, how you position yourself in terms of price? How tricky or sensitive is that of a, of a task? I think, it's, I think it's a key part. I think it's a key part of, um, of a brand's promise, mm. right? Um, I mean, like, look, for example, I mean, when Apple, like, what was it? I, I think Apple tried to do a low priced uh, iPhone for what? Um, I think it was five years ago. The, it was made out of, it wasn't made out of the, the metal and the plastic. It was, oh, the metal and the glass was made out of the plastic and they were colored and they were cheap. It failed. Hmm. They could more easily sell their 800, 900, 1,000 dollars and they could sell a $200 phone. It's crazy. It was off brand and it did not, and it's like, why do I, you know, it's like, that was, that was, that was, that was a misstep on Apple's part. It's similar to the, not similar, but I mean, let's say Toyota, Toyota could have easily produced a cheap, uh, sorry, a luxurious Toyota, but they didn't, they set up, Lexus, right, uh, as a subsidiary. So the, the high-end Toyotas are the Lexus, but because the brand, it's a diff it comes under a different brand, people do not get confused and they don't say, wait, hang on a moment, that's too expensive for a Toyota. Does it make sense? Yeah. So ideally, no, I, if, yeah. mm, please, please go on, please go on. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I, I, I agree with you. I think that that was a smart move on their part. I think there, I think there are brands like Kia and Hyundai, I personally think I think they struggle because mm. under under their under their banner, they're not creating a clear. It's like, well, what are you? Uh, there's no such thing as well. We're a car company. Mm. Okay, that's like a, that's like a, I don't. You know what's what what's what's your deal? Are you providing value? Are you providing like, for example, for many years, Volvo was all about, Volvo was synonymous with safety, right? Yeah, security, yeah, safety. You know, and so that was their positioning. And, you know, but Volvo has done a pretty good job of kind of, you know, elevating, you know, really providing a higher quality thing. 
Hmm. And I think they've I think they've navigated it a little bit better than some of the others. But um but I mean I think I think Kia and Hyundai, I just I'm like, you know, their cars look like they're decently made, but I as a consumer, I look from the outside, I'm going, you know, I don't I don't I have no idea what Kia stands for. I don't I don't have the perception that Kia is a is a valuable brand. Mm. I don't have I, Hyundai seems like it may be a little have a little more altitude. I don't know, but but I think that I think that what Toyota did was smart. I mean, it was the same thing with with uh, with with Honda, right? Honda also tried to promote a, a high end car, and it failed as well. Mm -hmm. Honda are they, are they under the Honda label, and it failed. Right. So the, right. there must be a logic there because you are correct. If you are just a car company, it's like okay, I said burgers, okay. Fine, but what do you I mean? Why why should I care about your burgers? Why should right. I care about your cars, right? Why should I care about your brand? This is a valid yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll I'll give you I'll give you a very, very interesting example. Not many people know of know of this because it's been a while since we made it, but there like for example, in the middle of America where we are, there was a there's a come there's an entrepreneur who said hey i want to launch a burger i want i want to create a, a mm. burger restaurant and i'm thinking to myself why in the middle of the united <laughs> states do you want to open up a burger restaurant i'm going all right you got you got mcdonald's you got you got wendy's you got burger king you got uh there's a there's a, a chain called culver's very very popular out here uh, and then, uh, then a whole bunch of independents. But you got those. You go okay. So uh, my big challenge was how the hell do I make a, a burger relevant, right? So, so the, the, this the gentleman says to me, he goes, David, I've my whole life I've loved burgers and trains, right? Burgers and trains, and I'm going. Mm -hmm. I'm going, how do I, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? I'm like, Steve. come on. And so anyway, so you know, we're, we're doing our homework. We're doing our thing, this, that, the other, blah, 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 blah. And what ends up happening is I come up with, I, I finally come up with this and it's just killer. Um, basically what ends up happening is it's, I, it's a, a, a very vintage image of a, of a burger on train tracks in the middle of nowhere. It's like a vintage illustration, but it's beautiful, it's yummy, delicious looking cheeseburger. It's things enormous, right? And it looks like if you, if you were to do it in real size, it looks like the thing looks like it's like, you know, 11 feet wide, you know, and seven feet tall. I mean, it's like things enormous in the middle of nowhere. And the headline simply read, I'm just going to spell it out for you so you can say in your head. C H E W period. C H E W period. Choo choo. Ah, oh my God. That's fantastic. <laughs> do, you come up, do you come up with this? Yes. My yes. God. David, so you also do the design. You have, you have, do you have a yes. graphic designer background? Oh, absolutely. You, 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 so you, see, you see, you see that paint, you see that painting right there? That that's George Harrison. I did that when I was in my teens. Mm, so I, I can see I, some color, colorful pictures behind you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And and and, uh, and this one right there. You yep. know, I, I did I did that illustration. So yeah. No, I, I'm I'm oh, I've, I've always enjoyed I've always enjoyed art and design as well. Fantastic. Besides besides mass, message and language. So you managed to I choo choo. It's fant fantastic. Well done. Well done yeah, on I, that. Thank you. Okay. Let me ask you something about something relevant or more more relevant to how you how we met in inverted commas on linkedin how important let's pivot to pun intended let's pivot to uh, personal branding now how yes. important is personal branding today the million dollar question is it overrated is it underrated um, what's your take mm -hmm. my take my take is this i think i think it's very important and i'll tell you why um, to me, the brands that are the, that, that are the stickiest hmm. are brands that actually have a human component to them. R Richard Branson with Virgin. 
Elon Musk with Tesla, mm. Steve Jobs with Apple, Warren Buffett with Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you know, you look at these and and you look at like there are you look at the brand. Let's look at let's look at music, music groups as brands. There mm. are brand there are music groups that are sort of groups. But when you have a lead singer who's like charismatic, you have Steve Tyler with Aerosmith. Mm. You know, you have John Paul George Ringo, right? You have uh, you have Bono with U2, etc. Um, so you know you have you have Bruno Mars. So I mean, to me, the, the personalization mm. adds a human component, and I think that that's very very important. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons. Yeah, you have you have customers who buy Samsung, but Samsung. There's, to me, if Samsung wanted to truly elevate its 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 relevance in the world, it would be adding a person. You know, they're right now they're just a big entity, right? Uh, Microsoft, big entity. You know, I mean, it's just like it, there's no there's no personal con, you know connection, and I think that that can happen. Do you think that's a very very fair point, and I think it's very helpful as well. Do you think that coming back to Apple? Okay, of course, Steve Jobs was an icon, all right? Okay, he wasn't such a great manager, but that's, that's not the important point here. The, he was an icon. Do you think that after his death, Apple began to lose its clarity, perhaps, or its direction? Have you sensed? Maybe, maybe due to a personal bias, I have a personal bias because Steve Jobs is not there, okay? That perhaps Apple, despite the one trillion capitalization, may find itself in a confusing new landscape as regards its mission and its, its vision. I have, two, I have two answers to that. One is, is that I think if Steve Jobs were alive today, I think it would still, I think it would be, he was such a strong personality and he drove innovation so hard. Um, I think that that's one component. But at the same time, I think they've really done an amazing job carrying on the legacy of Steve Jobs. I mean, you'll just look at the, you look at the new campus, you look at the new theater, mm -hmm. You look at the new things. Is it as innovative as it would be if Steve Jobs were alive? I would say probably not. Mm -hmm. But, but I think they've done an amazing job in staying true to the the dreams and 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 visions and aspirations of Steve Jobs. The same way that Disney. I mean, Walt Disney isn't mm. alive, but yet we still have a Disney legacy, right? Um, and you still look at you, know, you still look at I mean even even with Pixar right Pixar was you know with with being under under Steve Jobs and that and bringing that into the you know that still has a legacy so how much are they breathing life newly into the original beliefs and values and standards of the initial visionary I think is what they have to stay true to and I think I think Tim Cook. You know, Tim Cook is mm. not an not an innovator, but he's an excellent operations person to do mm. what they've done to continue. You know, look, I mean, what, what I forget his name, uh, the 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 nightmarish um, uh, car, the the guy who was uh, from the from the car industry, Emilio, what's his name? And before before Steve Jobs came back. Where they drove, where they were driving Apple into the ground. It was the most mismanaged, you know. Mm. Tim and Tim, if Tim Cook was terrible, they would have seen that decline. But Tim Cook is good at, you know, uh, from an operation standpoint, he's good at, at helping bring that stuff about. So I applaud him on that regard. I agree. I agree as well because they still bring out some amazing products. Okay, they. Yeah, bro. Here, here's a perfect example. These are great. I love these. Are you kidding? These are great. I've bought the Beats on the Power Beats because I I prefer them to stick around my ears. But those ones ah. are great as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's a great that's a great example of a of a really good product coming in the post Steve Jobs era. I'm sure yeah. he 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 must be proud wherever he is. Yeah. So 
yeah, you're correct. Hum humanizing the brand is really important and fundamental. And the examples you gave with Samsung versus Apple, uh, that's a good example as well. And when I think of personal branding, I'm sure you know who I have in mind. This guy pops in mind and I'm showing a, an overlay of Gary V. What do you think of Gary V? Oh, I've, I've, heard, I've heard of him. <laughs> I, I, I've seen a couple of posts here and there. Like, yeah. That's a, got, a, a, a great a great example. Would Vayner Media be as mm -hmm. relevant without Gary V? No way. No way. Not at all. Wouldn't happen. What do you think that it's the the big sort of benefit, the, the big advantage that Gary V has? Is it his speed? Is it the fact that he rose to fame early during the wine library? The, what is what is the, no, the thing no, that he's, gives him he's his edge? Tireless. His his work his work ethic is insane. His work he is willing to you know it's kind of like I saw an interview a great interview um, by Will Smith and Will Smith you know he's like you know people have asked about it my success he says and this that the other and is it my talent and is it my this and is it my that. And he goes, he goes, the one thing I can tell you is I may be more talented or I may be less talented, mm. but I will never, ever be, I will never, no one can outperform me. When others have stopped running, I will keep running. And I think that that is, a, is very much what, I mean, the one thing I point out to people, I think Gary's a great example. I mean, he's a terrific example of, of being ridiculously prolific. You know, the amount of content that he puts out is, is insane. I mean, last I had heard, he had, he had a 25 person team handling just his own content alone. 25 people. So he doesn't, and, so please go on, please go on. 25 yeah, people, and, my God. 25 people. And so, well, yeah, I mean, they're going through his, his videos and they're going through this and they're repurposing it as text and repurposing it as tweets and repurposing it as, you know, TikTok and repurposing it as this, is that the other. And, you know, he is a, he's ridiculously tireless. But the thing that I will say is look at the hustle that he mm. still puts in. He doesn't have to put it in, but he does. You look at the hustle of Damon John. Doesn't have to put it in, but it does. Look at the hustle of Grant Cardone. Doesn't have to put it in, but he does. Um, so you look at these people and you go, these people who don't have to, but yet still do, if they're still hustling this hard, how hard do you think that you need to, to be relevant in the world to have an impact? And I think that that's the answer. And, you know, and, and these guys bring life. I mean, you know, FUBU would not be what FUBU is without Damon John. Mm. Damon adds the human quality. Grant adds the, the, his human quality to, to his different growth con and all the different stuff that he does. And and Gary does it very well with Vayner Media, Vayner Sports. You know, the wine texting, the this, that, the other. You know, and all the all the different venue, uh, different adventures that he has. I think that. Uh, Gary V, I mean, the impact that Gary V has is enormous. So many people want to be like Gary V, and that's not necessarily a good thing, but the very fact that so many people are out there putting out content, sharing videos, yeah. documenting the journey, what he says, yeah, don't wait for the perfect video, the perfect podcast, you know, try and adjust and become better. So his impact is really massive and many people are, and I, I, I am wondering whether people may be misled into thinking that by posting 30 pieces of content per day, they can become Gary Vee. I mean, what's your, what's your view on content? Let's take it a bit, because this is the last part of the podcast and we're wrapping up. Yeah. What yeah. do you think of content? Is content really the key to success, is it the key to the long, to the long game? Consistent content combined with a clear branding message. How do you how do you see the content game on LinkedIn, but not only? Let's say LinkedIn. Okay. Well, the basic thing is is that one is I think that there's an equation that many miss. 
There's quantity, there's quality. Quantity, quality. So you go, okay, which, which one is it? So you go quantity, how many pieces are you gonna get out per day? And are those quality? If they're just, if there's low quality, then you basically are just, you're just, it's, you're just being noisy. People will ignore you, people will. My, my personal barometer is this. Do I consider, do I consider that what I'm putting out with that, the person at the end of reading that or watching mm -hmm. that, that they will have learned something. If I cannot answer yes to that, I will not put it out. And will they have learned something? Or if it's just designed to provide entertainment and just be a little inquisitive, so will that will that have? Uh, will they feel like they've that one minute or three minutes or four minutes that they've invested were, was time well spent? That is, I have to be able to answer yes to that. If I cannot answer yes to that, then then I don't post. So the pre so the so the pressure comes on me. Can I answer yes to that? And if I and if I can't answer yes to that, well, what you know, my next question is, what do I then need to do to convert this eh into whoa? And that's on me. I've got to, I've got to be able. So I, I have that standard. Doesn't mean that it has to be perfect. Doesn't mean that it has to be flawless. You know, because I'm not going to like Gary Vee professes. I'm not going to. It's not going to be along that line of okay, it's got to be perfect or this that the other da, 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 before you ever get it out there. He goes, it's not a summer blockbuster. It's a freaking. Mm. It's a moment, right? So, um, so that's the that's the basic thing. It's a quality and quantity thing. You got to take those two things and balance them. And if you do that, then then you're good, but you've got to be able to be honest with yourself. Is what I'm sending out there just crap? Because how many times, how many times does someone need to encounter crap of yours if they're going to look at 10 of your posts over the course of, let's say, a few days? How many, at what, at what point does it become like, you know what? I have a 50 50 chance that I'm either going to like what, what he put out or dislike what he put out. That's horrible. That's a horrible reputation to have. You know, if I'm not if I'm not at if I'm not at eighty or ninety plus, I'm blowing it. And I think that that's the that's the metric that I personally use for adding value. I wonder whether there is a third dimension, a third pillar to the equation. First one being quantity. Second being quality. Do we also need to add relevance? In what sense? Do I also need to consider? Is this post taking me closer to converting? Is this post taking me closer to my target or not necessarily? So do we also need to add into the equation aligning our each and every post of ours with the end goal, which is perhaps for, for you a new branding assignment, perhaps for me a new consulting assignment? Is this a, a valid third pillar in the equation i i don't i wouldn't say it's a third one i'd say it's mm. it's it's one that you monitor i think it's absolutely always got to be present in your equation mm. i wouldn't say that it's like a i mean the the the, the these other two are kind of like they're, they're almost like opposites you could put out tons of quality mm. quantity with no quality and you're like shot and or you could do tons of quality but you do only one post a month Hmm. So the thing is, is if you don't have those in balance, they're going to impact what you just mentioned. So I think that I think that you always have to have that in mind. How is this serving hmm. the needs of the of the viewer, of the reader, of the audience? And how is that serving us as a brand? It's like, who am I serving? I think it's a different I think it's a different paralleling equation. Who is who am I serving here? Because if because there were there are some people who put on put up posts that I refuse to interact with because you know what it's only serving them I could I could see through it and it's like it's only their way of saying how great they are and I and I don't I don't need I don't need to be told a fiftieth time that you're amazing you're 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 God's gift to the world I don't need to, I don't need to you know it's like that's boring to me so I need to feel that I've gotten something it's like wow I just learned something. 
Mm-hmm. I didn't didn't get just, and it's the difference between did I learn something or did I just get reminded of something I've already heard that I that I've already heard fifty times before? I don't want to do that either because that's not good quality to me. I don't want to be I don't want to be a deja vu moment mm-hmm. where someone goes. I feel I've heard this before. I feel like I've read this before. You know, it's like that would be terrible, right? What about niching your message? Is it a is it a trap? Let's say that you decide that I will only be offering branding and design services to car companies for whatever reason, and then your message on on social media becomes specially targeted to car companies is it's just an example is it a is it a trap to niche way too narrow can you get out if you change your mind well well uh, gary v is the uh, is the perfect answer of can you get out he started out as wine library mm. right and then he morphed into uh, you know entrepreneurialism and hustle and, uh, and having an agency so you can certainly get out i think it's the difference of is I, I think this is the most pivotal distinction mm-hmm. is the niche defining me or am i defining the niche mm. which goes back to the question of, of how strong you as a person is as a brand does it make that's sense right. that's right so so if you manage to build yourself up as a compelling trustworthy brand Perhaps you can get away with many different niches. Niches does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think so. As long as long, if the connecting strand is you, that's awesome. If everything you're bringing, if everything you're doing has an element of you in it, and if you represent, and if you stand for innovation, if you stand for mm. disruption, if you stand for this, if you stand for that, then you can bring that to anything. But that's why the difference is, is like, you know, is the niche defining you or are you defining the niche? If you're defining the niche, there's no downside because you can now pivot. If the niche is defining you, now the niche has become your master and there's too little of you present and there's more of the niche present. And so I think that you just need, you just need to know who's in the driver's seat, the niche. <laughs> That's a that's a great mindset exercise as well, yeah. because you are correct. You are absolutely correct. So, what about your book? Your fantastic book that I'm seeing everywhere. Uh, it's and I, I need to get I need to get a copy. Is is it? Do you have a an update coming up? Any new success? Any 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 new stories to share about the book? I've seen so many people, important people, write good things about it. You must be very happy. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, well, the the answer is, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the the people that have read it and and raved about it, I'm thrilled. Um, I mean, Bill Dolan is uh, is a four forty year uh, veteran of of TV production and events, uh, Emmy nominated, and he absolutely says this is the best branding book ever written. Um, you know, Claude Silver, who mm. works with Gary Vaynerchuk um, as the chief heart officer, said that this is that this book is absolutely an incredible example of design and branding uh, and story. And that the, her only regret is that she didn't have this book at the beginning of her career. You know, so I mean, so 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 what happened was, was once the book was released and it also is not designed, it, do, it doesn't look. And by the way. Make sure get, get yourself a hardcover. Don't get the paperback. Get the hardcover. That's the best production device. You deserve the paper. You deserve the hardcover. Get the hardcover. But the mm-hmm. but the thing but the thing that happens is that's why I put together the brand intervention masterclass. Mm. Right, we're we're literally we started enrollment now, and what's happening is that the you know that's going to be an eight. Well, I call it an eight week sprint to greatness. And it's going to have, it's going to take you so far deep, not only into the book, but into other tools that complement the book. I mean, I go over things like, I go over the 69 different differentiators that a brand can actually implement 
when most companies are basically implementing about five or seven of them, okay? And so I go over this, I go over all the different aspects of branding and how to craft your story and how to build your brand and how to know whether you're in the sweet spot or you're not. Um, it's just, and the, the different levels of differentiation that there are. You know, some people think, oh, well, oh, we'll just differentiate. No, we'll just differentiate. And so they differentiate. I'm going, what? And why should anybody care about that? So, you know, they, they, it's a stupid differentiation. It's, it's not irrelevant. But some just do different to be different. And they don't realize that there's, you, you have to reach a, a level of remarkably different. Mm. You have to be where it's like it's different and remarkable, not just different. Uh, some people think that different is the finish line. Different is the starting line. And so these are the things. So, I mean, the Brand Invention Masterclass, that's something that is very, very powerful and very potent. And I can't wait to deliver that because this is going to be weekly. And we're going to be, oh, the, the amount of stuff that's going to be going on, it's going to be insane. People are going to, people's heads are going to explode. I think that this brings us full circle, my dear friend David. Yes. I highly encourage everyone who is watching all that, who will listen to the audio version of the podcast to check out David's work, to check out his book, Brand Intervention, and to go and subscribe and enroll in his masterclass. I personally vouch for you, even though I don't know you personally, I see your work, I know that you are trustworthy, I know that you work a lot, you put in the hustle and the, the, hustle and the hard work. So I, I just want to say thank you so much for, for being uh, present on this podcast. Absolutely. No, my pleasure. Absolutely. My pleasure. I, I love, I love the, the questions you asked and the discussion and the interchange and uh, they're, they're important points. I mean, the bottom line is, is why, you know, I'll, I'll leave this for you and your listeners. Why just do something ordinary when it can actually be extraordinary? Why not take the extra steps necessary to raise it and elevate it to the level of extraordinary? That to me is, is what it all is about. David, thank you very much. Thank you to our viewers for attending and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, David. Thank you. Bye-bye.